Chicago Tonight, Black Voices, is made possible in part by Fifth Third Bank and by the support of these donors. At Fifth Third, we believe when diverse voices are heard and empowered, communities are made stronger, lives are made better, and the future holds greater promise for all. That's why we're proud to support Chicago Tonight Black Voices. Together, we can make a difference. Together, we can drive change. Good evening and welcome to Chicago Tonight Black Voices. I'm Brandis Friedman and thanks for sharing part of your weekend with us. On the show tonight, the Supreme Court overturns Roe versus Wade. Reaction to this historic reversal on abortion and what it means for Illinois. And Americans hit with sticker shock at the grocery store and gas station. Economy watchers weigh in on the impact and chances for a recession. A one-on-one -on -one interview with Chicago's new director of re-entry. Willette Benford joins us to talk about her plans to help formerly incarcerated people coming home from prison. The historic DuSable Museum gets a name change, why it's adding education to the title. And a library in Garfield Park with some valuable art gets vibrant new work from its artist in residence. But first off tonight, reaction pouring in to the Supreme Court's historic reversal overturning Roe versus Wade. That is, of course, the landmark 1973 decision that guaranteed federal rights to an abortion. Friday, justices ruled the Constitution does not protect a right to an abortion, and therefore, such a ruling shouldn't have been in place. Immediately after, protesters and demonstrators on both sides of the issue surrounded the Supreme Court. Abortion regulations are now up to the states. And in anticipation of this decision, several states have already issued abortion bans. Advocates for reproductive rights are worried about how this decision will impact those seeking access to a safe abortion. Even though we knew it was coming, you know, we were pre-warned in a way, it still feels very much like a gut punch. And I can't help but feel this overwhelming sense of loss um, for so many, so many women, so many girls across our country that this is going to impact. Um, very negatively. It really is going to impact um, black and brown women and people who can become pregnant. That includes people on the LGBTQIA spectrum. Um, that includes any marginalized person, um, women in poverty, um, because those are the people who do not have the means to travel extensively to go to states where they may safely seek um, legal abortion services. Now, the ruling won't change abortion access in Illinois, but the ACLU warns it's not just reproductive rights that could be at stake. The decision could impact other rights the Supreme Court has deemed constitutional, like same-sex marriage and rights to contraception. What I will say is this case is more than just abortion. Um, this particular case today talks about abortion, but it is grounded in the right to privacy. Um, there are many other significant rights wrapped up in the right to privacy, um, someone's ability to make their own personal decisions about using birth control, um, about who to marry, about who they love. Um, those are all bound up in the right to privacy, and those are all going to be on the table now. Anti-abortion groups celebrated Friday's ruling. Illinois Right to Life released a statement saying in part, quote, with today's decision, pro-life citizens must work harder than ever to defend life in Illinois. The ruling in Dobbs v. Jackson Women's Health is an incredible victory for our nation, but here in Illinois, the work of pro-life advocates is just beginning. Americans are also feeling the pinch as the U.S. experiences record high inflation. The inflation rate reached 8.6 percent last month, the highest level in 40 years. Food and energy prices in particular have skyrocketed, forcing the government to take action. The Federal Reserve is raising interest rates to bring down demand. And just this week, President Joe Biden called on Congress to pause federal gas taxes for three months. Joining us with more on the impacts of inflation and how people can respond are Tassos Mayaris, a professor of economics at Loyola University, 
and Christian Wasike, a Chicago financial advisor and chair of the Association of African American Financial Advisors. Thanks to you both for joining us. Um, Professor Mayoris, let's start with you, please. Could you uh, briefly explain what is causing the inflation that we are experiencing? Uh, I would say that uh, there have been three specific waves of inflation. If we go briefly a year ago, July, August, September, we were recovering from COVID. Prices were going up at approximately 3 to 4%. The economy was doing well. At that time, we dismissed it. And we said that it was transitory. It was not going to last. Well, go to October, November, December. The economy continued to do well and to grow very, very fast. And there were as you recall, a big demand for used cars because we couldn't produce the uh, new ones. Airlines had difficulty with personnel. So inflation from 4% grows to 6%. And very quickly, uh, you know what happened in February and March and April with the war in Ukraine. So the eight, almost 9% inflation, I can break it down for you, that 6% is because the US economy is very robust and growing very quickly. And the other 3% comes from the global markets. Christian, over to you, what is the impact then? Because obviously we're seeing rising food prices, energy prices especially. What's the impact of those two uh, things on everyday Americans, especially those with lower incomes? Uh, great question, and thanks thanks for having us uh, on this panel. One of the immediate impacts is that we will uh, uh, lower income families will have less discretionary income uh, to use uh, to uh, actually secure items that they need for everyday living. Um, in times of inflation, um, we already know uh, it saps up uh, any discretionary income that that is found in our households and. Those discretionary incomes uh, are used to, you know, plan vacations, plan for retirement, uh, save for a rainy day. And uh, we have families actually now tapping into those reserves uh, just to survive today. And so what we actually are seeing is uh, when we, we extrapolate that down the road, uh, we'll have less people prefer, uh, prepared uh, for an active or even a stable retirement situation. Uh, Christian, do you think there's a disproportionate impact on African-Americans? Oh, absolutely, there's a disproportionate impact on African Americans for several reasons. Um, I'll, I'll share two. One, uh, you'll find that African Americans uh, in general in, in the state of Illinois are still experiencing higher than normal uh, compared to other ethnic demographics uh, unemployment rates. Uh, as of right now in Illinois, uh, employment rate for black African Americans is at 11.1% as compared to 5.3% for Hispanics. Um, what that means is that there are less people employed, so there's less income in our communities, um, and there's less help uh, available for others uh, that, that may uh, need that, uh, need, uh, you know, reach out to find family members uh, to borrow money uh, just to, to make ends meet. Uh, the next uh, cha challenge that we have with this is that you find that most Black or African Americans are in um, uh, clerical positions in the hospitality industry or, or in minimum wage jobs. And so when you have an increase of inflation uh, without a proportionate increase in take home pay, um, that actually ends up bringing, uh, having these families and breadwinners uh, bring home less money. Um, and, and so uh, critical decisions are being made um, about where people, whether they go see doctors or whether they provide you know, food uh, for their families. And these are conversations and positions that no family in America should be in today. Now, to address inflation, the Federal Reserve has raised interest rates three times since March, uh, likely to do so again next month. Here's what Chair Jerome Powell uh, had to say in front of a Senate committee hearing this week. At the Fed, we understand the hardship that high inflation is causing. We are strongly committed to bringing inflation back down, and we're moving expeditiously to do so. We have both the tools we need and the resolve it will take to restore price stability on behalf of American families and businesses. It is essential that we bring inflation down if we are to have a sustained period of strong labor market conditions that benefit all. Professor, could this move lead to a recession? Uh, the odds at this point are about uh, 50 percent. The discussion, as you have read in the news, is uh, used with the illustration of a soft landing. So let me simply say that 
in order for an airplane to soft land, it starts at 40,000 miles and it takes about half an hour to drop to approximately 20. And the last 15 minutes is the soft landing. In view of the fact that the Federal Reserve is late in acting, instead of moving gradually, a quarter of a percent very, very slowly, they are doing what we have all witnessed very radical 875 basis point changes. And uh, we anticipate for the next two or three meetings to be at least that much, maybe they will adjust it depending what the situation is. In view of the size of those increases, the probability of a recession increases. Uh, Christian, as a financial advisor, what should people be doing now uh, to manage their money as we ex experience inflation and potentially, potentially head towards a recession? 50-50, uh, Professor Myers just told us. And, and that's, a, that's a great question. Thanks for asking that. You know, I, I always recommend families seek out a financial advisor to spend time with to talk about their personal situations because everybody's situation is different. And so at the Association of African-American Financial Advisors, one thing that we've made immediately available to our community is access to financial advice. And so on our website, uh, members of our community can reach out and uh, look for financial advisors uh, in zip codes closest to them and schedule free consultations to understand what their financial picture looks like today and, and how they can manipulate their current savings uh, or financial situations to prepare them uh, for what's coming down the road. Uh, I spend way. a lot of my time with, uh, with clients explaining um, that it, it is crucial uh, to spend time with an advisor. Uh, and and, and so I, I just I ask all, all, all your guests and, and listeners um, to look for a financial advisor, take their advice. Um, because those families hey, are obviously, again, sorry to coming. jump in, but we're out of time, but those families are obviously going to have some important decisions to make. That's where we'll have to leave it. Uh, Professor Tassos Mayoris and Christian Wasike, thanks to you both for joining us. Thank you for inviting us. The historic DuSable Museum has a new name. It is now the DuSable Black History Museum and Education Center. Now that's changed from the DuSable Museum of African American History. Museum leaders unveiled the rebranding at a Juneteenth celebration last weekend. The Hyde Park Center was founded in 1961 and is the oldest independent black history museum in the U.S. Because Education has always been a cornerstone of our mission here. Uh, we decided to put it in our name uh, and really own and claim our educational role. Uh, and it is, especially today, so very, very important to understand that everyone, not just Black children, but all children, all people, deserve to learn the history of America, which is Black American history, uh, is American history, um, but also the importance of recognizing the connectedness of Black people across the globe. It's our hope that by spreading the word, by actually experiencing these stories and these narratives and creating a greater understanding and connectedness between all people, that we can go forward making good history together uh, in the future. We're making history right now at this moment. And a new logo was also unveiled, the Do, which encourages Americans to take action and do something. Up next, we're one-on-one -on -one with Chicago's new director of re-entry, who's leading an initiative to help formerly incarcerated people. A new Chicago office aims to help formerly incarcerated people reacclimate to life in the community after life behind bars. Willette Benford, who has served time in prison herself, has been appointed to serve as Chicago's director of reentry. It's a newly created role that was part of a $13 million initiative to support reentry services for people leaving prison. And Willette Benford joins us now. Willette, thank you for joining us. Congrats on the new position. You've, uh, you've been serving in this job as the new director of reentry for Chicago for about a month now. What would you say is first on your agenda? 
Thank you, Brandis. Uh, really, what's first on my agenda is really listening to the community, uh, the community that I come from, to uh, really make decisions about us with us. So what that means is just really um, touching base again with what people need when they come home. And, you know, there are basic needs that people have when they come home, but also there are needs that sometimes people don't talk about when they come home. Each individual's uh, circumstance is different. And so wanna be able to address it holistically so that whatever an individual needs when they come home, we're able to provide it as a city. Give us a sense of some of those needs. What are some of the biggest challenges? But you know, what, like you said, what are some of the needs that they don't talk about? Some of the needs that individuals don't talk about is that overwhelming uh, feeling of being pressured into different things. So there's a mental health need so that uh, a therapist is provided for everyone leaving either ID, IDLC, Cook County Jail. Health care is very, very, very important because there's really poor health care when you're inside. And also coming back into the community and having a job with livable wages. You know, uh, workforce development, being able to have paid trainings. A lot of times people go to these trainings and they don't have money to make it to the training. You know, so once uh, a person is in, introduced to a training, a workforce training, it should be a paid training. So therefore they can make enough money to be able to live while they're getting trained. And also uh, working with uh, Department of Housing to see how we can provide stable housing for individuals that are returning. A lot of times landlords don't want to rent to people that have been formerly incarcerated. When I came back home, I was denied housing based off my background, which was almost 25 years old. And, you know, there was never a conversation or anything. Just look at the paper and deny someone. And that's something that we really want to work towards, removing systems that have been in place, archaic systems that push people out simply because they have an arrest or a conviction. So a, a 2018 report by the Illinois Sentencing Policy Advisory Council found that 43 percent of those who are released from prison each year recidivate within three years of release and 17 percent will recidivate within one year. Um, how do some of the challenges that you just mentioned, mental health, employment, housing, how do they impact recidivism and what are your plans to uh, address those prison return rates? Well, the prison return rates, first of all, Brandis, I, I believe recidivate or recidivism is a system word. It speaks to me having everything that I needed and then I went back to prison, which is a lie. You know, and a lot of times it's difficult to talk about recidivism, prison, and anything else without talking about race. You know, black people make up 14% of the Illinois adult population, but over 54% of those incarcerated. And so when we talk about that, we talk, we have to also go to poverty, you know? And so when you talk about somebody recidivate, re recidivating, it is saying that the people had what they needed and they ultimately went back to jail. That's not true. We are saying a second chance city, but we also want to be someone who gives a fair second chance because some of the second chances were not second chances at all we were set up for failure. And so those things that I named are things that need to be scaled up so that when people come back home, they're able to connect with them right away. The first 30 days that a person is home is a crucial period because if I can't feed my family in two weeks, then I'm in a desperate mode. So and it's really saying, let's have resources set up so that when someone exits the penal system, or when someone comes home after serving their time, that they, the it sounds like you want to be sure that you work, have those access, barriers. have access to those resources to, to support yes. them. Um, before we're out of time, of course, we know that you were formerly incarcerated yourself. How does that experience sort of um, influence uh, the work that you'll do and and the decisions you'll have to make? It influences it because I'm not here to go along to get along. I am here because of my experience and also because I advocate for those who are just like me. And those who are just like me 
I wanted us another chance, a fair chance. And I know that people that are coming home, if you give an individual a fair chance, they'll exceed your expectations. About 30 seconds left. Will what are, what are, how do you measure success? How do, how do you know that you're doing a good job? I measure success by when individuals come home and they have re-entered the city of Chicago, the resources that they need are made readily available for them through a seamless process, which is a one-stop shop so that I can get everything that I need. Okay. Willette Benford, the city's new director of re-entry. I believe this is the first time the city has had a position like this. Congrats on the new position and thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, Brandis. Up next, visitors to a West Side library can now enjoy museum quality art while they browse. Stay with us for a look. There is museum quality artwork in Chicago that's free for anyone to see. It's in the city's first regional library, which opened in 1920 in the West Garfield Park neighborhood. The library has been renovated and one of its newest features is a person, a resident artist. Producer Mark Vitale has an introduction to a young artist who brings vibrancy to her residency. The Legler Regional Library in West Garfield Park is home to a lot of books, naturally, but also valuable artwork and the studio of a new artist in residence. I am Haitian American, very proud Haitian American visual artist, I'm very much interested in my culture, food, as well as art practices that span from painting to printmaking. I make work based on what I know and what I've experienced. So that comes from ancestors who have obviously gone on, but then also like current day family members who are still living now. Travels that I've taken throughout the African diaspora, vibrant colors because that's what I saw. So growing up, I saw Haitian artwork in my house. That was the first art I ever saw before I got to art history one and two in college. So. That's what I show is the vibrancy and the joy that I know. The residency gives the Miami-born artist a small studio in the library. Alexandra Antoine has filled it with works by artists that she admires and her own works, paintings with hand-sewn beaded sequins and collages that feature a lot of food. The other art form I'm interested in is culinary. <laughs> I consider every woman in my family a chef. So whether they went to school for it or not, they are what I call a chef. And a lot of people are interested in food, especially me. <laughs> and she volunteers in the neighborhood. She calls it being in the mix. In the mix, but also like very intentionally like wanting to be in the mix, not just how can I volunteer here so two weeks down the line I can ask you for something, but really like how do we build this connection? Because I also live in the neighborhood. The Legler Regional Library is also home to Floating Family by the artist Elizabeth Catlett and the large-scale painting Knowledge and Wonder by Chicago artist Carrie James Marshall. That's the artwork the city had planned to auction for millions in 2018 until widespread criticism stopped the plan in its tracks. And there's a WPA mural from the 1930s with dated depictions of Native Americans and a modern response to it by Native American artist Chris Papam. All of these works will make good company for a new work by the current artist in residence. Alexandra will be here for two years and she'll be working with people in the community, with the students that we work with in the schools, um, adults, teens, children, and then she will be creating a, an art piece over the two years that will be uh, housed here at Legler. She was born for this, you know, she's here as an artist, she's here to create work, but she's here to work and connect with people as well, and I'm so excited that she gets to weave in her culture and her heritage and her passions. 
It is a big deal. Now I have, I gotta be honest, I've done some artist residencies before. This one is new for me because it's in a library, which I also love, like I've always loved the library, but that is exciting that it is in a space where I can do research and do my art practice as well. For Chicago Tonight Black Voices, this is Mark Vitale. Alexandra Antoine will be the artist in residence at Legler Regional Library through the end of next year. The library is located on South Pulaski Road in West Garfield Park. You can see more of her work on our website. And that's our show for this weekend. Be sure to check out WTTW.com news for the very latest from WTTW News. And if you're watching us on Saturday night, know that you can also catch Black Voices and Latino Voices on Sundays beginning at 10 p.m. And Monday at noon, join Paris Shuts for our next virtual community conversation. We'll talk about youth mental illness ahead of the PBS documentary, Hiding in Plain Sight. To RSVP, visit WTTW.com slash events. Now for all of us here at Chicago Tonight Black Voices, I'm Brandis Friedman. Thanks for sharing part of your weekend with us. Stay healthy and safe and have a good night. Closed captioning is made possible by Robert A. Clifford and Clifford Law Offices, a personal injury law firm pleased to give back to the community through numerous charitable initiatives.